Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm reading my final presentation. It's an alchemical view of spiritual emergency. And my partner is here <clears throat> recording with me. So I'm reading it not only to you, but to him for the first time. So this is kind of a version of reality TV. Okay, <clears throat> as I begin, I want to invite you to close your eyes. So I want to start out with a visualization. As I walk toward the center of my alchemy library, laboratory, I take care to notice the texture of the stone walls, the feel of the somewhat uneven flagstone floor beneath my feet, the shelves lined with beloved books, and the tables of varying heights strewn with projects and experiments of all kinds. Nearing the center of my laboratory, I begin to feel the heat radiating out from the fireplace, where a massive cauldron stands suspended over the flames. This is the heart of my lab, the heart of my work, the heart of my heart. Arriving at a spot near the fire, but still a comfortable distance from its heat, I gaze into the big black pot at the smaller vessel inside it. This receptacle is thick-walled and strong, yet also translucent so that I can see the contents within. Watching the mixture bubble and steam, I ask it, this roiling mass of my life's work, to show me something important about what I'm working on right now. These have been hard, hard days. No sooner do I begin attending to one major project than another one seems to break down or rupture. My energy and stamina have been tested to their limits. All my old recipes have begun to fail me, and tried and true methods upon which I have relied for years are suddenly yielding strange results and unwelcome ends. I want to understand what is going on, what is happening to me. Within seconds of asking my question, the shiny, caramel-colored substance begins to spin up and out of its crystal vessel, forming two separate streams. Each font quickly morphs into the shape of a human figure. And as the liquid continues to flow upward, the figures spin together, intertwine, and embrace. The words come to me. I'm learning how to love. I'm learning to be in relationship. This is my work. I am astonished. But there are so many other seemingly more critical or worthy tasks that I'm supposed to be working on right now. My mind wants to protest. I need to find a new job. I need to heal my chronic pain. I need to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I need a real career. I need to amount to something. But the vision gently persists. I begin to surrender. Usually skeptical of such imaginings, I know on some level that this one is revealing a deep truth. And even though this vision occurred as the result of a guided meditation in a graduate level course, and even though love is not a traditionally acceptable topic for academic writing, it appears that soul does not care one whit about these trifling details and is commanding that love be the focus of my final paper. Introduction. And if you've had your eyes closed, you can open them now or keep them closed, whichever. What follows is an exploration of my current transformational crisis or spiritual emergency through the lens of alchemy. The last year has ushered in the most difficult, humbling, and deep-seated shifts in my body and psyche that I've experienced in well over a decade. Because of this, I have not chosen to analyze, as might be expected, a well-known event from the national stage, but rather my own process. It may be an unconventional approach, but it is rich subject matter nonetheless, and will serve perhaps better than anything else to illustrate the use of alchemical principles in everyday life. Many factors have and are contributing to this stage of radical transformation, including seismic shifts in my health, my home, and work and I will address them each in turn. However, falling in love is at the core of my process. Indeed, it would not be unreasonable to say that of all the factors, 
It has been the most revolutionary, destabilizing, and evocative of the pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone. I will also include in my analysis certain pivotal dreams, which indicate various stages of the alchemical work. In fact, as this piece of writing takes shape, I expect that more dreams will come, representing the ripening of my process. The writing itself, then, is part of the work, bringing attention and awareness to my journey and moving it forward in real time. The Dream, or Prima Materia. How to describe the fundamental reconfiguring of a life? Let me begin with a dream. Although I was already well into my transformative breakdown, which I consider as having begun in the spring of 2014, this dream appeared nine months into the process, in December 2014. It was an explicit harbinger of what was about to become its most intense, challenging, and destabilizing phase. I include the description here as I recorded it at the time. December 15th, 2014, giving birth. I realize that I have a baby in me. I look in the mirror in my room and spread my legs, and I'm surprised to see the top of the head visible there. So now that I've seen it, there's no way to stop the birth process. Oh my gosh, I'm not totally ready. I'm just here by myself in my room. But I start to lie down because this is going to happen now. I think of my white carpet and all the blood but there is no time to prepare otherwise. I lean back, and without even much effort, the head starts coming out, and I reach my arms around to catch it, and before I know it, there's a little baby lying in my hands. It was so fast. I'm astonished. I did it all by myself. I am relieved and amazed that it was so easy and painless. I mean, what luck. That's really unusual. She's a little girl, not moving, not very bloody, I look closer and she does start to move and talk. I don't feel a rush of maternal feelings. I can't remember what I'm feeling. I think amazement. I go into my parents' room carrying this new baby to show them and I hold her out in my hands and I say, her name is Clara and she's really verbal. Clearly, this dream is a classic illustration of prima materia, or first matter. Quote, the alchemists inherited the idea of the prima materia from ancient philosophy and applied it to their attempts at the transformation of matter. They thought that in order for a given substance to be transformed, it must first be reduced or returned to its original undiffer undifferentiated state. That's from Edinger. In this dream, I've returned to my original condition as a newborn infant, ready for transformation and growth, ready for the real alchemical work to begin. Indeed, it does not seem incidental that it appeared about nine months after the initial stirrings of my shift began. As Edinger asserts, quote, fixed, developed aspects of the personality allow no change. They are solid, established, and sure of their rightness. Only the indefinite, fresh and vital, but vulnerable and insecure, original condition symbolized by the child, is open to development and hence is alive. The image of a child in dreams can symbolize the prima materia. With this dream, my psyche could not have delivered a clearer message that my alchemical journey was about to begin in earnest. Little did I know it, but certain, quote, fixed, developed aspects of my personality would indeed begin breaking down in ways that would prove decidedly uncomfortable. Certainly, I was already on the path and had been for nine months. I'll address in more detail why I consider March 2014 to have been the starting point. But it had been something akin to waiting in line to board a monster roller coaster at a carnival. As the minutes pass and the, and the line snakes along, you can see the massive structure. You can hear the shrieks of the other riders and get an inkling of what's in store for you. You start to feel a little nervous and get excited. But it's not until you strap yourself into the car and it begins moving up the track that the journey truly begins. Your stomach drops, your throat tightens, and it changes from something anticipated in the mind 
to something fully experienced in the body. Background, solutio and circulatio. For many months leading up to this dream, I had been enduring debilitating chronic pain in my neck, shoulder, and arms. Truth be told, the pain had dogged me in some form or another for almost five years prior to this, causing me to seek help with physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, and chiropractic adjustments. But it had gained particular momentum and intensity in March 2014. This is why I mark my transformational crisis as having begun at this point. I began to acknowledge the hard fact that life as I knew it could not continue in the same way. Something fundamental had to change. But I was at a loss regarding exactly what this change was and how to make it happen. What had brought me to this point? What was the crucial ingredient that ushered in this dawning realization? I was falling in love. I met a man who soul recognized as a game changer, a kindred spirit, a disruptor of my patterns. On some level, it knew that if I were going to open myself to loving and, perhaps more importantly, receiving love from this person, some of, my deep, some of the deepest structures in my psyche, the very same structures that were also implicated in my chronic pain, would have to dissolve and wash away. Fears, rigidities, boundaries, and protections that had functioned to keep me safe were now direct impediments to love, change, and growth. True, Chris had moved into my home on March 1st, merely as a housemate. There was no overt sign of romance until a few months down the road. But soul anticipates on a subtle level what, ego, what individual ego becomes conscious of only later. With the presence of this man in my home, my pain, which I had heretofore been able to keep somewhat private and hidden away, had a sensitive and attuned witness. My suffering was starting to leak out and be noticed in ways that were, for me, new and unsettling. I did not like to have my weaknesses observed much less responded to. I did not want to be pitied. But rather than diminish and allow me to contain it, my pain increased. It had found something of an outlet, and in spite of my best efforts, I found myself cracking open and breaking down. The horror! Not only in the presence of, but sometimes in the very arms of this man. My choice of words in describing this process is no accident. Going over them with a discerning eye, it becomes glaringly apparent that the terms dissolve, wash away, and leak out indicate that, with the entry of Chris into my life, I was plunged into the alchemical operation of solutio. In alchemy, solutio refers to the washing, cleansing, or dissolving of the substance being worked with. And falling in love is a kind of dissolution. For what could be more powerful than love at dissolving egoic boundaries and individual psychic structures? Even the language we use, falling in love, indicates the submersion of the self in something like a pool or a, or a lake, a liquid containing matrix. One does not fall upon love or step over to love. One falls into liquid love. One is dissolved by it. Edinger has this to say, Love and or lust are agents of solutio. This corresponds to the fact that a particular psychic problem or state of development often remains arrested or stuck until the person falls in love. Then abruptly the problem is dissolved. Although new complications appear, life has begun to flow again. It has been liquefied. He goes on to mention that, quote, whatever is larger and more comprehensive than the ego threatens to dissolve it. In my case, I had been limping along with chronic pain for years and acute pain for months. I was not happy about it and was growing less and less satisfied with my life. But at least I was still in control. I was making sensible, rational decisions and operating in a way that I was used to. My boundaries, defenses, and coping mechanisms, although rigid, 
and increasingly constraining were familiar. Even though I wanted something to change so that I would no longer be in pain, I was not able to figure out how to get from here to there, so to speak. There was no force in my life big enough or comprehensive enough to overtake or engulf my habit energy and egoic will, something that would ultimately be necessary to bring about radical transformation. Love entered and became that force. Yes, pain had been a powerful agent, nudging me along, forcing me to make certain adjustments, but love engulfed and began to really dissolve me. By May of 2014, with Christopher's support and encouragement, I made what felt like a radical decision. I would take a medical leave of absence from work. Although this felt risky, drastic, and possibly selfish, the typing and desk work required to do my job exacerbated my neck and shoulder pain beyond tolerance. Once my leave was granted, I spent four months away from the office, living with friends and family in the Pacific Northwest, where I grew up. During this time, I hiked, prayed, read, and spent as little time on the computer as possible in an attempt to heal. Again, I knew that my chronic pain was related to profound change that was trying to come through, or, more specifically, that the pain was related to my resistance on various levels to this change. Still, I didn't know what my new life was supposed to look like. I knew my old routines were not working, but I didn't know what to replace them with. Looking back now, this time away from work has the characteristics of circulatio. Circulatio refers to the distillation of a liquid by circulating it over and over. From a psychological perspective, it means examining certain problems and motifs that keep recurring or circulating again and again in one's life. This was a time of introspection and taking stock of my life and it often felt like going around and around in my head, which I would then try to sort out by writing in my journal, which would invariably cause a flare-up of my pain. I felt stuck in a cycle. Granted, I was away from work, which was a welcome respite, but I was not moving forward, so to speak. I was making the rounds from massage therapists to chiropractors to physical therapists to Pilates instructors in an attempt to get relief from my pain. None of them was having any lasting effect, and every time I tried to write, for journaling had been a powerful spiritual and psychological tool for me since childhood, I experienced a pain flare-up. The alchemist considered circulatio the stage wherein something is being refined and purified. It seems apparent now that this was indeed the case, but it didn't feel like it then. Prima Materia and Calcinatio. After four months away, I returned to San Francisco and to work part-time in September of 2014. Granted, my job was problematic, but I hoped that a reduced work schedule would be a stopgap measure against quitting entirely, until I had some idea of what else I would do. By this time, the pain was slightly more manageable, but still very present. I knew in my heart that it was related to not only the physical mechanics of the job, i.e. typing and working on a computer, but to the promptings of soul. This position was not my calling, and to the degree that I devoted most of my time and creative energy to it was standing squarely in the way of soul's increasingly insistent urgings. In his book, The Soul's Code, archetypal psychologist James Hillman puts forth the idea that each of us is given, before we are born, a, quote, unique diamond, which has selected an image or pattern that we live here on earth. This soul companion, the diamond, guides us here. In the process of arrival, however, we forget that we forget all that took place and believe we come empty into this world. It is then, then one's task to remember, or perhaps get out of the way, so that the diamond who, quote, remembers what is in your image and belongs to your pattern, can effectively guide you to your destiny. Perhaps it would be more apt to frame the necessary action rather than getting out of the way as coming into alignment with one's diamond. But whichever, Hillman points out that, quote, 
A calling may be postponed, avoided, intermittently missed. It may also possess you completely. Whatever. Eventually, it will out. It makes its claim. The diamond does not go away. The difficulty comes when one is fairly certain of what isn't one's calling, but has not yet formed a concrete idea with regards to what is. In these cases, as in mine, life can become excruciatingly uncomfortable as the urgings of the diamond point one away from familiarity, comfort, and safety, but do not make crystal clear the proper path to move toward. One is left suspended in an existential void of sorts, with one light fading into the background, but no discernible beacon to illuminate the path ahead. Although, in fairness, it may not be correct to blame this soul companion for not being clear. It may be more accurate to acknowledge that years of accumulated ego strategies and defenses, not to mention dominant culture messages and misleadings, create such an encrusted buildup of confusion and misinformation that it is near impossible to sift down through the layers of detritus in order to discern the simple guiding voice of the diamond. This is more or less the human condition and the great task and challenge of life. I had also, come September, moved back in with my new love. Hi, love. Because we had begun as housemates and because the realities of the San Francisco housing market make finding lodging somewhere between impossible and a miracle, it made sense to simply move back into the same house together. Only this time, we were not just housemates, we were partners. One need not be an alchemist to know that the initial stages of serious love are associated with fire, passion, and heat. These connections are made in myth, fairy tale, and modern songs and movies. In alchemy, the operation associated with the element of fire is calcinatio. This is the stage when fire gets applied to heat up and catalyze the substance being worked upon. Careful attention must be paid so that just the right amount of heat is applied. Too little, and the work remains cold and stagnant. Too much, and the work may burst into flames and be destroyed before it is ready. Ultimately, the idea is to burn away impurities and leave what is pure, strong, and worthy. I am not someone who falls in love easily. On the contrary, for me, it is an exceedingly rare and precious occurrence. And, as the weeks living with Christopher unfolded, I began to understand why I had been mostly single during my adult life. Falling in love, real love, transformative love, can be terrifying. In addition to the joys and delights new partnership with a truly kindred spirit, oh, joys and delights of a new partnership with a truly kindred spirit, I began to experience some unfamiliar fears and anxieties. As I mentioned earlier, Certain rigidities and defenses that helped to form and maintain my personality structure had begun to dissolve upon meeting Chris. However, by November, we had moved past that delicious melting phase and things were heating up. In fact, it could be said that certain aspects of my personality were being subjected to the unrelenting flame of another person's attention, day in and day out. In the midst of the love, which was definitely present, the fire of calcinatio was beginning to produce some discomfort. I was used to doing things independently and spending a lot of time on my own. It was easy to choose what I wanted to show the world and what I wanted to hide. Living with a lover, especially one I was still just getting to know, was proving to be an intense trial by fire. Edinger talks about the ruling principle of the ego, or the dominant value around which the personality is structured, as being personified as a king in alchemical texts. And there are many images depicting the king being burnt on a pyre, shoved into a stove, or boiled alive in connection with the calcinatio operation. Then, quote, after a descent into hell, the ego, or king, is reborn, phoenix-like, in a purified state. 
So viewed from the perspective of alchemical soul work, then, the dominant value around which my personality had been structured, defend, achieve, be self-sufficient, was being challenged, or rather, burnt up in the fire of calcinatio. In order to love and be loved, I had to incorporate another's care. I had to soften. I had to be vulnerable. I had to learn that I could depend on another. Real love is no joke and no skip through the tulips. The stakes are high. It takes a powerful force to create enough heat and pressure to cause elements of the personality to actually melt and then burn up in service to growth. Popular media do not typically portray this face of love. We get images of passionate couples having mind-blowing sex, or earnest lovers professing undying devotion, or the man swooping in, saving the woman, and then it's happily ever after. Romantic love, according to dominant paradigm wisdom, should make you feel giddy and lustful, or happy and fulfilled. When angst and terror are involved, it's usually because someone is cheating or a lover has died or something is wrong. It's never because the relationship is progressing along as it should, creating a powerful alchemical container for two souls to acknowledge, confront, and subsequently burn away deeply rooted yet semi-dysfunctional aspects of their personalities. With regards to love as an agent of calcinatio, Edinger includes a selection from T.S. Eliot. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of pyre or pyre, to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised the torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame, which human power cannot remove. Much of the fall of 2014, then, was the steady process of love heating things up and beginning to burn away layers of habit and defense. As I previously mentioned, however, alchemical texts emphasize that the intensity and timing of the fire being applied is critical to the work's success. The famed alchemist and Franciscan friar Roger Bacon speaks to this in his Radix Mundi, he says, and the gentle or temperate fire is that only which completes the mixture, makes thick and perfects the work. The happy prosecution of the whole work consists in the exact temperament of the fire. Therefore, beware of too much heat, lest you come to solution before the time, before the matter is ripe. For that will bring you to despair of attaining the end of your hopes. Wherefore saith he, Beware of too much fire, for if it be kindled before the time, the matter will be red before it comes to ripeness and perfection, whereby it becomes like an abort, or the unripe fruit of the womb. In our case, falling in love and immediately living together proved to be a recipe for nearly immolating ourselves entirely. By December, it became increasingly clear that if we wanted to build a solid foundation and preserve a lasting and more stable connection, I would need to move out. This, accompanied by the additional ego destabilizers of continued physical pain and the knowledge that I probably needed to leave my job and perhaps my PhD program, was enough to thrust me out of calcinatio and into the darkest of all operations, mortificatio. It seems apt that this occurred at the onset of winter, the season of long nights, hibernation, and underground incubation. Mortificatio and the vessel. In the weeks prior to the in the weeks prior to the dream of giving birth to myself, my physical suffering had reached a debilitating crescendo. I had sharp nerve pain radiating from my neck down my arm, making any position uncomfortable and wreaking havoc on my sleep. In a desperate attempt to diminish what I knew to be a ramped up stress response in my body, which was not responding to acupuncture, physical therapy, massage, rolfing, and other physiological healing practices, I changed tactics somewhat and began working with relaxation techniques, mantras, and meditation. In combination with a few other supportive measures that I put into place, 
These caused me to shift focus ever so slightly from the physical to the psychological. Of course, this duality is more or less a mental construct. They are, at bottom, indivisible. An excerpt from my journal at the time describes the beginning of this shift. So yesterday I get home and I'm feeling hopeful, feeling like I'm making strides. And I remembered how awful it felt years ago when I was completely depressed and anxious right after moving back to Seattle when I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. How unbearable that was. And suddenly I had this overwhelming realization of, holy shit, I would actually rather be in physical pain than experience that psychic hell again. As much as it hurts and constrains my movements, it's better than psychological hell. And in that moment, I realized what my body had been doing for me all these months and years. It had taken on the burden of stress and uncertainty to spare me the hell of psychological fear and anxiety. Suddenly, everything flipped, and I felt immense, tremendous gratitude and compassion. My body has allowed me to function these past five or six years at my job because I would not have been able to work in the kind of mental and emotional depression that I experienced back when I was living in Seattle. But I could work, just barely, with physical pain. So, rather than being my tormentor, my body has taken this hit for me. I felt amazed to suddenly switch out of this, my body is torturing me, to mode, to my body is trying to spare me mode. It was like night and day. And weirdly, within the next few hours, the massively acute, hot, tingling pain that I'd been suffering in my right arm for days substantially diminished within hours. It's not totally gone, but there's a significant shift. It's just astonishing. And now, the sheer level of stress and anxiety that I have been carrying about next steps in my life has come into conscious awareness. It has finally been allowed to move out of my body, again, not totally, but beginning, because it is safer now that I have consciously decided to take action with these calming practices and meditations. My body is basically saying, okay, finally, I can start to unwind this tension because you're taking it back, you're taking back from me some of this burden and working with it consciously. Until you agreed to do something that would help you metabolize this burden of stress, I was just going to keep holding it. It would have been too much for you psychologically and emotionally otherwise. So that was from my journal. Within a few days of this epiphany, I was visited by the dream indicating my state of prima materia, the birth dream. And what is particularly interesting is that I'm not only the baby in this dream, if you'll recall, I'm also the one giving birth. Thus, I'm not simply being reduced to prima materia, rather, I'm reducing myself to prima materia in preparation for the deep work to begin. This clearly points to the archetype of the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its own tail, symbol of infinity and rebirth that the alchemists borrowed from ancient Egypt. Jung has this to say about the Ouroboros. The Ouroboros has been said to have a meaning of infinity or wholeness. In the age-old image of the Ouroboros lies the thought of devouring oneself and turning oneself into a circulatory process, for it was clear to the more astute alchemists that, prima materia of the, that the prima materia of the art was man himself. The Ouroboros is a dramatic symbol for the integration and assimilation of opposites, i.e. of the shadow. This feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality, since it is said of the Ouroboros that he slays himself and brings himself to life, fertilizes himself and gives birth to himself. He symbolizes the one who proceeds from the clash of opposites, and he therefore constitutes the secret of the prima materia, which unquestionably stems from man's unconscious. After the birth dream, everything began to rapidly shift into mortificatio. Love's calcinatio had been steadily burning away rigid defenses, such that I was more emotionally exposed than I had perhaps ever been in my life. 
Pain made me fragile, vulnerable, and frustratingly dependent on other people. Mounting ambivalence about my job and PhD program, roles which had defined me for the past seven years, made me question on a fundamental level who I was and what I was doing with my life. In many ways, although I chose to focus on love's role in the process of calcinatio, the fire was also being fed by my waning enthusiasm for academic work. All my life I had been a natural student. I got straight A's, skipped a grade in school, earned a full ride to college, and genuinely loved learning in the classroom environment. If calcinatio is understood to be the operation wherein, quote, the dominant life value around which the personality has been structured undergoes reevaluation, end quote, then contemplating a flight from academia was certainly fanning the flames of calcinatio as well. Life changes of this magnitude all at once can feel not only challenging and destabilizing, they can produce a physical and mental state bordering on madness. Many times in these past months I have said to myself, am I going crazy? I can't handle this. This is too much. This level of tension and anxiety is impossible to hold. My body is going to break apart or my mind shatter into fragments. During these times, using an alchemical lens to understand that my process is in the stage of mortificatio has been invaluable. The notion that in the quest for the philosopher's stone or the self, one gets burnt to a crisp, reduced to prima materia, and only then the real work begins, which includes a harrowing descent into a shadowy underworld, this notion is immensely comforting when one feels as if one is being held to the fire, crushed in a vice, or exploded from within. The alarmingly gory images of dismemberment and hellish trials that Zosimos described suddenly become reassuring when one is experiencing terrifying dreams, paralyzing anxiety, a racing heart, and high levels of existential fear on a weekly basis. Rather than bizarre and terrifying, the images become normalizing. It was at this juncture that one of the principles at the heart of alchemy proved to be crucial for me as well. That is, essential to the work of transformation is a strong vessel or container. Otherwise, the work will break apart or begin to leak through and be lost or destroyed. Never in my life have I understood this at a deeper, more visceral level. For nine years, I'd been living in a small room in the Mission District. During much of this time, the room and the apartment served me well. It was a mere two miles from work and school, allowed me to gather community around me, provided easy access for visiting friends and family, and was close to parks and shops and restaurants. As my pain had increased over the years and months, however, and I had begun, I had begun to intuit a connection between this container, my room, and the fraying state of my mind and body. By the middle of December 2014, shortly after the birth dream, it became abundantly, painfully clear that the kind of transformation being asked of me would be nothing short of impossible were I to continue living in that space. The container had become cracked and weak, and my process corrupted and even poisoned. What did this look like? First of all, I had not been able to do any writing or creative work in my room for a few years. If I wanted to concentrate or get any flow of ideas, I had to leave the house. Physically, my room was a throughway for anyone who wanted to walk out to the backyard. The, the door to the backyard was in my room. So it was more of a passageway than a room. It was also located off the house kitchen, below the upstairs neighbor's kitchen, and adjacent to the next door neighbor's dining area. So this made it something like a box drum or a cajon with the percussive sound of feet and voices bombarding it from all sides. The times I could go to bed and wake up were governed by the unpredictable activities of people around me. From outside, the sound of nonstop air conditioning units and restaurant dumpsters being emptied at 4.30 a.m. leaked in. The room was totally porous barely more than a symbolic membrane between me and the psychic and physical energy of the vibrating mission district. This was tolerable when I was settled in my job, 
happily attending PhD classes, and pain-free. In other words, it served adequately when I was in a kind of stasis. But as this period of deep alchemical transformation gathered momentum with my job, my academic career, my health, and my love relationship all in question, and shifting rapidly, I began to feel the need to go within and attend to the process more and more. I found myself unable to do so in this container. It became a matter of utmost urgency that I have a quiet, safe place to rest, meditate, create, and sleep, and I could do none of these activities uninterrupted in this space. My anxiety level increased and my nervous system ramped up to the point where I required drugs to sleep for even a few hours. I found myself having active imagination fantasies of crawling into a hole in the forest floor. I longed to be surrounded by solid, noise-canceling, damp earth. I longed to be held securely. All of this points again to mortificatio, the stage in which the work depresses, becomes heavy, spoils and decomposes, and or otherwise invites the alchemist into low places of reflection. Says Edinger, quote, Mortificatio is the, negative, is the most negative operation in alchemy. It has to do with darkness, defeat, torture, mutilation, death, and rotting. However, these dark images often lead over to highly positive ones, growth, resurrection, rebirth. Viewed from this angle, my strange desire to crawl into the ground and cover myself with earth could be understand could be understood as an urge to compost myself in rich soil to descend into the undisturbed darkness of earth and surrender to decomposition edinger cites a passage from the golden treatise of Herm of hermes an old alchemical text which reads as follows Quote, o happy gate of blackness, cries the sage, which art the passage to this so glorious change. Study, therefore, whosoever appliest thyself to this art, only to know this secret. For to know this is to know all, but to be ignorant of this is to be ignorant of all. For putrefaction precedes the generation of every new form into existence. In the midst of all this upheaval and change, I did not realize the extent to which my room was affecting my process until the words, the key to all alchemy is the need for a strong container. A strong vessel is foundational to be able to do any of this work, rang out in class. I had, in essence, been putting off the prospect of moving because I did not think I could give up cheap rent made possible by my nine years of residence in this apartment. But in order to survive, or rather successfully morph, I had to give it up. I was a nervous wreck and needed a calmer, safer place. The framework of alchemy became very useful for stepping back and understanding the gravity of what was actually going on for me and what was required. It helped me to see that my situation was not one of simply needing to get it together and be less sensitive, or even one in which attending to just my physical health and internal psychological needs would suffice. Albertus Magnus stressed the need for, quote, a place and special house, end quote, meaning a sacred place set apart to attend to the work, and this is exactly what I required. It is, I think, a notion foreign to traditional Western psychology that a particular kind of personal or spiritual transformation might require a special holding place. So I'm grateful to alchemy for validating what I was intuiting so strongly, but had not quite been able to act upon. I moved to Oakland on March 1st, 2015. My room is spacious, the neighborhood is quiet, and I can go into my room at any time to rest, pray, cry, write, and sleep. Having a safe, quiet place to which I can retreat feels like a huge luxury. Also, this act of separatio shifted things immediately and dramatically for the better in my love relationship. In alchemy, the separatio operation is just what it sounds like, a process of cutting away, dividing up, or separating out what should not be part of the work. In our case, 
separatio needed to happen in order to counteract or rather cool down the raging fires of calcinatio. We had applied too much heat too fast and in some sense had melted together. Moving into a different physical space, separating myself out from the vessel in which our love had first inflamed, proved to be exactly what was needed at that stage of the work. With some distance between us, we could each focus on our own personal process as distinct from the intensity of the relationship process. For Chris was undergoing his own accelerated phase of individual growth and transformation, independent of me. Nevertheless, after a few weeks of relief and my nervous system calming down considerably, post-move, I am still deep in the throes of mortificatio. I now have a good strong vessel for my transformation to continue, and I have been opened up and had my defenses dissolved by love. In this vulnerable and raw state, then, there is nothing for me to do but be with the transformation that is trying to come through, sometimes enduring it with gritted teeth, sometimes feeling hopeful. I know that I'm in the midst of deep alchemical transformation because there are too many signs, synchronicities, and affirmations all around me to deny that this is the case. At the very least, my chronic physical pain has transmuted into a conscious awareness, or psychological pain, of the place that I'm in so that I can continue to work with and metabolize the changes. Thank God for my Jungian background. Thank God for this course on alchemy. Thank God for my wise partner and friends who understand the language of shadow and the phenomenon of radical transformation. Still, I'm often scared. I am often depressed, anxious, and worried that maybe this will go on forever, and in fact I have some kind of disorder, or I'm gonna go crazy. The disconnect between what conventional society tells me, that I must know what I am doing in life, have a set career, be successful and independent at this point in my life, is in direct opposition to what is trying to happen. This breakdown, breakthrough, this decay and putrefication of the old ego system in order to create fertile ground for the new self to emerge. It is remarkably difficult to maintain a sense of deeper, unconventional, personal truth in the midst of the daily grind. We are inundated with commercial messages aimed at propping up a false self and a false definition of success nested in a fragmented and alarmingly misguided society. In part because of this, surrender to the process is challenging. There really is no place in the industrial growth society for rest, decay, and least of all, putrefication. These things run, in every sense, counter to the capitalist agenda and a growth economy. When one leaves a job or position or lifestyle, one should have the next big thing lined up and ready to go. There is no time for rumination, reflection, a composting of what's been learned, or a laying fallow while the new growth germinates and waits to be born. Yet this is what nature and the alchemists knew to be necessary. These wise practitioners emphasized above all else how long the work, in other words, the emergence of the self, or soul, or what Jung called individuation. They emphasized how long the work takes and what fortitude it requires. They placed a huge emphasis on patience, diligence, and long-suffering were required of the alchemist, and maintained that doing the work quickly was in essence worse than not than do doing the work quickly was in essence worse than not doing it at all. From the famed 8th century Islamic alchemist, Jabir ibn Hayyan. Yet you must not think all this can be effected by preparation at once, in a very short time, as in a few days and hours. But in respect of other modern physicians, and also in respect of the operation of nature, the verity of the work is sooner terminated this way, Whence the philosopher saith, it is a medicine requiring a long space of time. 
Wherefore, I tell you, you must patiently sustain labor, because the work will be long. And indeed, festination, which means speed, is of the devil's part. Therefore, let him that hath not patience desist from the work, for credulity will hinder him making overmuch haste, and every natural action hath its determinate major and time in which it is finished. Conclusion As I suspected, the act of writing this paper has woven itself into my unfolding process. Two nights ago, I received a dream that gifted me a deeper understanding of what I have just described above. The dream is as follows. May 9, 2015. Smashing Larva. I am at the family beach house with Chris and his friend, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I see this little white thing moving on my scalp. Oh, gross. Is that a louse? Oh my god. No, it's bigger. I think it's a larva of some kind. I run over to them and ask them if they think it's a larva or a caterpillar or if it's a louse. And then suddenly it has this kind of sack on it, enmeshed in web, like an egg sack full of little spiders. And it bursts open. And instead of little spiders, all these larvae burst out about the length of my little fingernail, off-white, and they're sticking to me, and they kind of hurt. They sting when they stick to me, kind of like a jellyfish. And then they scatter everywhere. I try to go back to bed, but I keep waking up. And then I come back to the bathroom, and I notice that the little larvae are scattered around and stuck everywhere. They're stingy. So I figure I should try to smash them when I see them. I have some kind of cup in my hand with a hard ceramic bottom, and so I'm smashing them one by one where I see them, finding them and smashing them. They're kind of tough, actually. I can feel their little shell break when the edge of the cup comes down on one to sever it. It's not really a shell, but just the outer membrane. It's just, it's not just soft and squishy. I have to really make sure it's cut through. In one place, they are near a bunch of spiders, which I notice are very delicate and somewhat beautiful, the spiders, and I take care not to smash them. Nope, I'm just singling out the larva. This was a couple nights ago. So upon waking from this dream in the middle of the night, it became clear to me that I am, in spite of my best efforts, still resisting this state of mortificatio on a fundamental level. In the dream, I'm surrounded by larvae, the very agents of decomposition and putrefication necessary for the process that I'm in. In trying to smash them, I am resisting and trying to smash the state that I'm in right now, that is, being a larva, a creature in the beginning stages of transformation. Of course, the reason I'm doing this is because it's scary and painful. Each time one of them sticks to me in the dream, it physically hurts, and they've spread out everywhere. I think this represents my anxiety spreading out and contaminating so many different areas of my life. When I realized this, lying there at four in the morning, I felt a sense of sadness on some level that I am still so determined to eliminate these little defenseless things that are trying to facilitate transformation. It's interesting to note that the first one came out of my own head, much like Athena springing out of Zeus's head. My personal myth is that of Athena, who emerged full-grown from the head of her father Zeus. Anyway, after noting my sadness, I lay there in the dark, thinking, I guess I should stop trying to smash these little larvae, even though they're disgusting and painful. They just need more time before they can become beautiful become what they're meant to be. And then it hit me, this is mortificatio, oh my god, a time of decay and rot and putrefication. These little things are needed and necessary in order to break stuff down. They are what help to create the compost so that the new growth can emerge out of it. I should be grateful for this dream. In some senses, it couldn't speak more clearly. It's not like I just stumbled on a pile of larvae in the dream. They came from my own head. They came from me. And now that they've scattered everywhere, I just need to let them be and do their work. The sense of relief, reassurance, and validation 
that this dream provided me is a gift. In essence, it is one more little signpost that, indeed, soul and psyche know what they are about. In one more, it is one more entreaty to try and ease my resistance, my fear, of this process that is organically unfolding. In that same vein, I often think of the dream of giving birth, the original dream of pre prima materia. It reminds me that, in fact, I do come through this process, and indeed it is not as painful and drawn out as I might fear. And what of love? The scene with which I began this paper, which played out in my alchem alchemical laboratory, pointed to love as the foundational lesson that I'm learning through all of this. Certainly, I'm concerned with what my next employment is going to be. I'm still adjusting to my new home and trying to create community here. I worry about how I'm going to discern my calling and if I will find a way to be of meaningful service in the world. I'm also grasping at who I am and what I am worth in the face of potentially leaving academia a world with which I've been so closely identified for so many years. But underneath all of this, love is the substrate. It was love that broke me down, dissolved me, and kicked off this process in earnest, bringing it out of my body and into conscious awareness. And it is the love of my partner that, in many ways, serves as the mirror that continually forces my gaze back onto itself and obliges me to chip away at my ego's fears, defenses, and habitual old beliefs. Clearly, the lesson is that in order to love and be loved, I need to love myself. This is what I'm learning. Receiving the love of Christopher is teaching me this. Ultimately, I'm not just learning to be in relationship with another, our partnership is bringing me into relationship with myself in a deeper and more intimate way. In the end, it doesn't matter what my career looks like or how people perceive me. It doesn't matter if I end up with a PhD or achieve that which my culture deems admirable or appropriate. If I can stay with this process of dissolving old egoic structures, I can more fully surrender to love's liquid matrix. I will, if I can stay with this process of dissolving old egoic structures, if I can more fully surrender to love's liquid matrix, I will exist in a container large enough to call forth and nurture soul's plan for me. For indeed, the cosmos itself is a container whose entire contents is love. And I want to end with a poem from Hafiz called Tired of Speaking Sweetly. Love wants to reach out and manhandle us. Break all our teacup talk of God. If you had the courage and could give the beloved his choice some nights, he would just drag you around the room by your hair, ripping from your grip all those toys in the world that bring you no joy. Love sometimes gets tired of speaking sweetly and wants to rip to shreds all your erroneous notions of truth that make you fight within yourself, dear one, and with others, causing the world to weep on too many fine days. God wants to manhandle us, lock us inside of a tiny room with himself, and practice his drop kick. The beloved sometimes wants to do us a great favor hold us upside down, and shake all the nonsense out. But when we hear, he is in such a playful, drunken mood. Most everyone I know quickly packs their bags and hightails it out of town. And that's Hafiz. Thank you.